My name is Jeremy. I just want to wish you a happy Easter. We're so excited again of what God is doing uh, this morning. And I'm looking forward to see what God will do as we kick off uh, this teaching. So if you want to follow along with the teaching on your phone, you can go to oasisnfl.info. At the top of that, uh, there's a box that says today's teachings and click on that. And that will connect you to where we're going today. And all of our verses will also be on the screen as well. But we're kicking off a brand new series called The Most Interesting Man in in the world. Now, I want to share something with you, confess something with you. Uh, this won't make me extra spiritual, just so you know. Uh, in fact, it might be bring me down a little bit, maybe in your eyes, but I'm a huge fan of those Dos Equis commercials that had the world's most interesting man. Are you familiar with those commercials? Yes, they ran about a decade or so, all right? So they always had a picture of this guy up here. Uh, he would always share uh, an interesting tidbit about his life, something exciting that made him the world's most interesting man. He always had a, a funny statement or something or ironic or incredible that he would say. Uh, in fact, a few of them are, are simply this. Uh, the most uh, interesting man in the world, uh, he once taught a German shepherd to bark in Spanish. That's pretty incredible. The world's most interesting man, right? Uh, I like how he lives vicariously through himself. All right, He's kind of enjoying his best life now uh, by not looking anywhere else but only at himself. Uh, he once won the Tour de France, but he got disqualified because he was riding a unicycle. Uh, the world's most uh, interesting man. And then perhaps my favorite one of all, his mother has a, t a tattoo that simply says, son. I love that one. That's like my favorite one. His mom has a tattoo, says son. So the world's most interesting man. Uh, his actually, his name, the actor, his name is John. And John's been a part of Hollywood for several decades. In fact, uh, he always uh, was able to uh, pick up like on, on big character actors. I think he actually was on a, a Perry Mason way back, I think in the late 60s. And then was actually on Dallas for a little bit. So he's been on uh, guest episodes, but never really made it big. And so to, to be able to support himself, He's worked side jobs like construction or garbage uh, man for a while. He was a garbage truck uh, operator. And then actually uh, earned most of his money, not through Hollywood, but through network marketing. So we see a guy named John here uh, who lived a pretty good life. Has lived a pretty good life. But we wouldn't say he's the most interesting man in the world. In fact, maybe that's what you would say about your life. I mean, you've lived some interesting stories, some interesting adventures. But maybe not the most interesting man or woman who ever lived. And so today we're kicking off a series that's going to simply talk about the most interesting man in the world. And we're going to uncover some claims that this guy said. We're going to talk about some things that astounded some people, uh, were amazed some people, maybe even were offensive to some people. So we want to talk about these next few weeks. And so we're going to kind of issue a little challenge to, to come between now and Mother's Day, right? Mother's Day is May 12th. That's about four weeks from today, four Sundays. So we would encourage you to make this a habit, make this a commitment. Say, you know, we're going to be part of Oasis Church, part of this series to uncover and unpack a little bit more about what the most interesting man in the world had to say, and not only what he had to say back then, but how that has an impact on today's life, today's world, uh, today's life that we find ourselves living in. So we're going to talk about some things. In fact, this statement we want to uncover today is incredibly amazing, or it's incredibly insane if it's not true. So we want to find out, is this an amazing statement or an insane statement? And it simply says, this in John 11 verse 25 and 26 we see Jesus say this he says Jesus told her I am the resurrection and the life anyone who believes in me will live even after dying everyone who lives in me and believes in me will never ever die now on the face of this statement alone if you didn't know anything about this person you would think this is an insane person talking and anyone who believes in me will live even after you die. That doesn't even make sense. What in the world are you talking about? And then it says, everyone who believe, believes in me will never, ever die. Now, you have to admit, on its own, that's an incredibly uh, amazing statement. And especially if you can't back it up. I mean, anyone can say it, but can you really back it up? Can you make that true? Well, the one who says this, the most interesting man in the world, is actually Jesus. And he's going to say some things that are, that are uh, outrageous, but he has the ability to back them up. Because he's not just a normal person. He is 
fully man and fully God. The Son of God, the one who has come for us. And so we want to kind of go, okay, where did he say this statement? Where, what was the context? Who was he talking to? It said there that he was talking to a her, talking to a, a, a woman. Uh, so what was the context? What was going on in this situation? So all the way back in John 11, uh, at the very beginning in John 11 verse 1, we get a little under, better understanding of the context. And here's what we read. We read, a man named Lazarus was sick. He lived in Bethany with his sisters, Mary and Martha. So the story unfolds with the guy who is sick. Now, this guy who's sick, Lazarus, he doesn't have allergies, all right? He's not dealing with pollen in Jacksonville in April of 2019. He's not doing that. He is sick unto death. Like, he is sick, like, about to die. So this is a serious illness that he has. And we see where he lives. He lives in a little village called Bethany. Uh, and he has two sisters, Mary and Martha. So there's a group of them, a family. It's kind of how uh, the scene unfolds. And it says in verse 3, here's what's going on. The two sisters sent a message to Jesus telling him, Lord, your dear friend is very sick. So here we see that, first of all, there's a connection they have with Jesus. He's not just some normal guy. He's not just some uh, random celebrity they're going to try and contact. They actually know Jesus. There's a personal friendship they have with him. And Lazarus is so seriously sick, they're like, you know what? We better phone a friend. We better call Jesus, we better get a hold of him because unless Jesus does something, it doesn't look good for Lazarus. So they sent word to Jesus and they said, hey, they remind him, hey, remember us, we know you, we're good friends, we have a relationship with you, and it's not looking good for Lazarus. We need you to do something. Well, we read in John 11 that Jesus gets this message, he hears that he's sick, and the world's most interesting man does something strange. He does nothing. He doesn't go toward Bethany. He doesn't send a message back, all right, on the way. He just waits. And in fact, he, he pushes pause almost for, not, not, not for 15 minutes, but for a couple of days. And he waits so long that Lazarus, meanwhile, back in Bethany, actually dies. Like he passes away. It's the end of the story for Lazarus. He is gone. It's over. Or at least that's what we would think in a normal situation. So the family back in Bethany, including Mary and Martha, prepares their brother for burial. I mean, you can imagine all the emotions they're, they're going through and all the thoughts and the feelings, feelings that they're having. And, and you can imagine all these things going on and they're, they're getting him ready. And they, they would, in that culture, they would wrap him in, in grave clothes and, and preserve the body and seek to honor uh, Lazarus as well, even after he's passed away. And they place him in a tomb and they have the funeral and everything. And then Jesus starts to come toward Bethany. Jesus starts to go toward them. In fact, we see that he waits three days until he arrives at the house of Lazarus. Now again, these are normal, everyday people like you and me. Lazarus, Mary, and Martha. And Mary and Martha are still there. And you can imagine, they would have been a little ticked at Jesus. Like seriously? Like what have you been doing? We, did you not get our message? Yeah, I got your message. Well, what in the world? How come you didn't know? Where, where have you been? What is going on? What took you so long? You can imagine they would again, again, their emotions are raw with the loss of a loved one and, and the heartbreak and heartache that goes with that. And so they're there and, and, and they're just kind of unventing a little bit. And you would have been the same way. I would have been the same exact way. In fact, Martha says this in John 11, 21. She simply said, listen, if you had been here, Lord, if only you had been here, my brother would not have died. And basically, again, we read the verse and kind of move on, but put yourself there for a moment in the, emo in the emotions and the feelings. Listen, Jesus, this is your fault. Like, if you had been here, we wouldn't be having a funeral right now. We'd probably be having a family dinner together. Where were you? What, what happened? We were depending on you and you didn't come through. What happened? And Jesus simply says this. Just a few sentences later, Jesus tells her, your brother will rise again. Now you can imagine, in that moment, there's confusion. She's venting, she's hurting, she's kind of lashing out a little bit, and then Jesus simply says, you know what, your brother, he's going to rise again. And that would have confused Martha. It would have confused us. As they're trying to figure out what, what's going, going on here, and you can just imagine, she's going, no, 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 Lazarus is dead. He, he's been dead. It's been a, a few days now. What, rise again? What does that even mean? 
Oh, I, I don't fully understand what you're saying, Jesus. That's what Martha would have been thinking. And I think you and I would have been saying the same exact thing. And then Jesus says what we read earlier. Something profoundly interesting. He says this to her. I am the resurrection and the life. Anyone who believes in me will live even after dying. Everyone who lives in me and believes in me will never, ever die. And then he says, do you believe this, Martha? Martha, do you believe what I'm saying? Now again, on the face of it, it's incredibly insensitive if Jesus can't back the statement up. It's incredibly uh, uh, offensive. We're at a funeral and you're saying that anyone believes it? We believed in you. We sent a message to you. We thought you could do something. And now you're saying he would never die, but he's dead. And you can imagine all that she's going through. And, she, and Jesus asked her that question. Do you believe? Do you believe this? And her response is one of affirmation. Yes, Lord. She told him, I have always believed you are the Messiah, the Son of God, the one who has come into the world from God. She says, right now, if you're asking me, do I believe? She says, yes, I believe you're the Son of God. I believe you're the one we've been waiting for. I believe you came from God. I believe you're able to do even the outrageous, to be able to come through with a claim that makes no sense. I believe you. You see, she says she believes. And the question we want to wrestle with is, do we believe? Do you believe? That Jesus is who he says he is. That he is the resurrection and the life. And so after he has this conversation with Martha, Jesus goes toward the, the grave. And he sees people who are mourning the loss of, of Lazarus. And they're crying and wailing out in their emotions. And, and here we see that the emotions well up in Jesus as well. In John eleven thirty five, the shortest verse of the Bible. If you ever want to memorize a verse, start there. It just simply says, Jesus wept. Jesus wept. You got that. You nailed it. Next, on to the next one, right? And so we see again that Jesus wept, weeps. He joins people in their sorrow. He, he joins us when our heart breaks. He, he joins us in our tears. And even though Jesus knew what he was going to do next, he still took the time to feel the moment and to join the people in their emotions and to even get angry when we read that at, at the, the fact that there is death and there is brokenness and there is pain as a result of the sin that's in the world today. And so Jesus simply says this. He tells some of the guys who are with him, hey, roll away the stone. The stone that's in front of Lazarus' grave, roll that stone away. Now again, it's been a few days and Martha pipes back up. Hey, hey Lord, just so you know, it's been a few days and it's not going to smell good. Just so you know, if those of you have teen uh, boys at your house, right? Like, kind of like, don't open that room. Just so you know, that it's going to stink. Just so you know. And, there, and even one of the translations, it says uh, that he's stinking by now. I like that. He's stinking by now. Don't open that. And Jesus said, listen, we're going to open that grave. You're, something's going to be amazing here. And they roll away the stone. And, and Jesus walks up to that tomb and he simply says this, Lazarus, come forth. Lazarus, come out. Now, some pastors, some scholars well, like to point out that if Jesus didn't specify Lazarus, that perhaps every grave in that cemetery might have had people come to life out of that. And so in that moment, he's saying, Lazarus, only you at this moment, everyone else, you're going to wait your turn. Lazarus, come forth. And I don't know if there was a, a slight shuffling noise or, or a sound, but all of a sudden, Lazarus comes coming toward the entrance and he's wrapped up like a mummy and he's coming toward them. And he is alive. A, a few moments ago, Lazarus was lying there, a, a lifeless carcass, for lack of a better word. His, his heart was, had stopped. His lungs were empty. There was no life there. And then at the words of Jesus, Lazarus come forth, the one who is the resurrection and the life, suddenly Lazarus, carcass, dead, now living being. Heart that was stopped starts pumping again. Lungs that were empty fill up with the breath of air. And Lazarus is alive and comes out of this tomb. Now, it's interesting again. Lazarus did not have that many problems. He didn't have 99 problems. He only had one. His one problem was he was dead. All right, that's a big problem, right? Would you agree with that? That's a big problem. You and I, we walk in with our issues, but we walked in with our issues, all right? We're still alive. We're still breathing. We woke up today. We don't have the problem of death. Lazarus had one problem, and it was a big problem. Now listen, again, maybe again, you're not experiencing death personally in your life. You're still alive, but you have problems. 
maybe, again, you're dealing with deadness in some area of your life. Maybe in your relationships. Maybe you, you had a marriage or a close uh, relationship, daily relationship that you've had many years and invested time together. And then suddenly that relationship just died. And what was once full of life is now gone. Perhaps, again, as we sit here in April 2019, you have a family member that you haven't talked to in, in forever. You've lost contact with them. Basically, you are dead to them, and they are dead to you. And you wonder, okay, what, what, what happened there? How do we get that back? Maybe, again, you have so many social media friends, but if you're honest, you are lonely. You, you know a lot of people online, but you don't have many people who have your back in person. And maybe, again, you're just feeling, I'm just bored to death. I just don't even know what, what, what my purpose is or, or why I'm here. Maybe you're, you feel like your career is going nowhere. You have a dead-end job and you dread going to work on Mondays. Maybe, again, that financially you're, you're, you're so far in debt, you're like buried six feet deep. And you're like, Uncle Sam, I know I owed you a couple days ago. you got to get in line because there's not enough money. And you owe all this debt. You're feeling, okay, I'm never going to get out of it. Or maybe it's a physical problem. Maybe you've gotten news recently, you personally or someone in your family, a physical diagnosis, and it stopped you dead in your tracks. You, you see, you might be alive today, but maybe there's some deadness somewhere in your life. We want to know, okay, Jesus, if you're the resurrection of life, what, what about this area? Are you able to bring life to this relationship? Are you able to bring life to even to myself and how I find purpose? Are you able to bring life to even you know, my finances or, or, or this physical diagnosis? Are you able to do something in this? And I believe that the resurrection and the life, Jesus, the most interesting man in the world, he has something to say to you today on Easter Sunday about these areas that we face in our life. And the first thing you might want to realize that maybe, maybe perhaps God has brought you here to simply here is, is that this, that God is able to solve that deadness. God's able to solve your problems. Well, we see again that the one who has uh, not only said it and interesting things actually did amazing things. And over and over again, he solved people's problems. Those who walked to him, I'm sorry, those who were in some cases were carried to him because they could not walk. They walked away on their own power, in their own strength, because Jesus heals people who are lame. Those who were brought to Jesus because they could not see, they were living in darkness, some even from birth, Jesus was able to give them sight immediately. They were able to see him face to face, and able to experience the world that he made. We even see here that Jesus brings dead people back to life. Jesus constantly is doing the miraculous. And isn't that the response we want to hear from God this morning? You have a problem in your life, a deadness in your life. You want to hear God say, okay, I got it. I'll take care of that. Oh, what? And the good news again is that God's able to do these things. And I've seen it over and over again. Those who thought their marriage was beyond help, beyond hope, through the power of Jesus, life was restored and brought back into that marriage. There's a vibrancy there as, they, as the two recognize as they pursue Jesus, they can find a love for each other that they thought was gone. We see that Jesus heals marriages, heals relationships. And we, I've heard stories of people who are diagnosed of certain ailments, of cancer and physical problems. They go in for the scan, and the scan shows nothing. Nothing's there. What happened? Miraculous healing. Been set free of that disease, set free of that cancer. I, I've heard of people who said, I used to have this job I, I didn't like, but then God guided me through here, and, and this opened up, and this opened up, and now I'm in this job that I love. God it miraculously solved problems. And perhaps, again, that's what God has brought you here today to know, to remind you again that He can solve that issue in your life. That when you're experiencing a, a deadness in that situation, Jesus is able to bring life to that. Because resurrection isn't just what Jesus does. It actually is who he is. He is the resurrection and the life. He is able to do a miracle and he's still in the miracle working business. If you do, amen, that was a good time. Just so you know, just, just, so, you're aware, just so you understand, right? So sometimes God will miraculously solve your problems. The second thing he might do is God might give you meaning in your problems. God might give you meaning through your problems. God may not miraculously solve it. He might let you know again that I'm going to give you strength as you go through this. That as you walk through that situation, you realize that you're not alone. That God is able to help you understand what you're going through and to actually have a stronger connection with Him. In fact, often at a funeral, 
I'll read Psalm 23. And Psalm 23 is often shared because there's so much encouragement for those who are going through that loss, and that heartbreak, and that heartache. In Psalm 23, verse 4, it says this, Even when I walk through the darkest valley, I will not be afraid, for you are close beside me. Your rod and your staff protect and comfort me. Some of you have memorized this. Even though I walk the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil. And sometimes, again, as we go through that situation, we want to be reminded again that God may not miraculously deliver you, but God is there with you in that moment. And that deadness, that experience, that problem that you're going through, that issue that you're facing, we want to recognize again that God is able to, to work and use that problem. It doesn't say that, that, that He will miraculously get you out of that. He says that He will walk with you. Now, honestly, you and I want the first situation. God, miracle, we don't necessarily choose God, walk with me through it. But that may be what God might do in your situation and your issue. And to encourage you today that He is the resurrection and the life. And the life is walking with you as you go through that uncertainty, as you face that trial, as you go through those obstacles. And be encouraged today that as God goes with you, you're not alone. We have a living Savior who's going through that situation with you. And some of the most inspiring people that, that I've met and that we've heard their stories uh, in our world and culture today are people who went through tough situations and, and they saw God do something in their pain and, and in their heartache and going through that obstacle and they're still facing it and we hear their story and we're inspired. And we need that to be reminded that God is still at work. And God is still faithful. And He'll walk with us through those problems. So maybe God will miraculously solve your problem. Maybe God will give you meaning in your problem. Or perhaps God will give you people to help you get through your problems. To recognize again that God sends people our way for such a time as this. That God is able to bring people to encourage us. To pray for us. To, to hold our hands up. To support us as we go through those things. In fact, as Lazarus went shuffling out of that grave, Jesus told some of the guys, hey, go, uh, unwrap him. Go help get those old things off that are binding him. He doesn't need them anymore. He is alive. And God gives a community to people there in, Lazarus, in the story of Lazarus. And God gives us a community as well to help us be set free. We all need people who God has done a work in their life when we are losing faith to come alongside and build our faith up to pray for us, to encourage us, to remind us that we're not alone. And what God has done for them, God's able to do for us. We need a community, a community of hope and grace. And that's what we pray that Oasis Church is for every single one of us, that we would recognize that God is at work and we can go through this. That no matter what we face, even death itself, we're not alone. We have each other as followers of Christ. We have Christ himself. And he is able to do a work. So whatever area of deadness in your life you're facing, God can bring life to that because he is the resurrection and the life. You know, no matter what we face, the reality is you and I one day will face the same problem as Lazarus. Now, I don't want to be a downer on Easter, but every single one of us one day will face our own time of unearth ending. We actually will pass away. And we want to know in that moment, Jesus, are you able to give us life if we believe in you even after we die? Are you able to give us life with you forever? We have that question. And we have to go back to Jesus. You see, Jesus made this claim, but, but was he able to make it happen in his own life? You see, if Jesus died and didn't come back to life, then he can offer us and guarantee this promise that he made to us, that he is the resurrection and life. So we want to know, okay, Jesus, did you back this clean up? Did it actually happen? And here's the good news about Easter. We believe it's not a story. We believe it's history. It actually did happen. And there are some cases of evidence that we want to pre present to you that we would cite, cite as historical evidence that Jesus Christ died, was buried, and that he rose again. The first one is letter C, all right? C stands for the crucifixion. It is historically noted that Jesus did live on earth, that he was born, and that he did die. And the way he died was by being crucified. This is a historical fact. And we believe again that Jesus did not pass out on the cross or faint. He actually did die. In fact, just to prove it, the executioners saw Jesus dead upon the cross and shoved a spear into his side. So much so that blood and water came out. Jesus died. He was dead upon that cross. And this was something that Jesus predicted and it actually came true. That he said that he would die by being lifted up. And we see that he is lifted up on the cross and he actually did die. 
So his method of death is a historical fact. And dead people are put in tombs. Jesus did die and was placed into the tomb. We see that there are two people that cared for Jesus, that followed Jesus, Joseph of Arimathea and Nicodemus, and they actually prepared his body. They put the wrappings on, just like Lazarus had, and they would have noticed, okay, this guy is just unconscious. They would have noticed if he was still alive. They said, no, he's actually dead. There are some people who believe that in the coolness of the tomb, Jesus was able to be revived and come back and to actually, he didn't really die. He just kind of passed out and was there. No, no, he actually was dead. I don't know about you, but they put you in ICU. If you've been through trauma, they don't just turn the air down. Just so you know, like, ooh, I'm feeling better. It's awesome. No, they actually do work. They do transfusion. They do stuff that's needed to help you get better. And Jesus didn't have any of that. So that idea of just to cool the tomb, that's incredibly um, uh, outrageous to consider that because he actually did die. And the disciples saw him die. They saw him placed in the tomb. And then three days later, they don't see some guy limping toward them, still bloody and still bleeding and just barely hanging. They see a fully risen, completely healed Jesus before them. So much so that these guys, many of them who denied Jesus, ran away from him when he was on trial and betrayed. Many of these disciples were willing to 10, 20, 30 years later die for what they believed in. They did not manufacture a story. Let's just, let's all say the same thing. No, no. They saw a risen Savior. And they gave their life. There was a change in these disciples. What happened? They saw Jesus alive. And the Bible says that 500 other witnesses saw a risen Jesus. Letter S, the skeptics were converted. People who hated Jesus changed by meeting Jesus. Paul was anti-church, anti-Jesus until he met Jesus, and then suddenly everything changed. When your worst enemy becomes a believer, something happened. And we see that Jesus appeared to him. In fact, Paul talked about it over and over again. And lastly, the empty tomb. All they would have had to do is say, okay, we know where we buried Jesus. Let's prove and see if he's actually there. The authorities knew where the tomb was. They actually placed soldiers in front of it to guard it. And they knew where the tomb was. And they knew that full tomb became empty. Jesus is alive. So Jesus says on the resurrection and the life, he actually dies and comes back to life. He was able to make that claim and then pull it off. Hey, listen, if you can do that, I'm going to look at other things that you say too as well. I'm going to put more trust in you as, you as the things that you've looked at in your life. And listen, Jesus said he would die, said he'd be buried, said he'd come back to life. And he actually pulled that prediction off. He has credibility. He is someone worthy of giving your direction, giving your attention to. He is Jesus. So because Jesus is alive, that first Easter, he's able to help us with the deadness in our life. He might do a miracle. He might give you meaning in it. He might give you someone to walk through that, but Jesus is there with us. And even so, when you and I face our death day, if you believe in Jesus, that he is the way, the truth, the life, that he is the resurrection and the life, then even though our physical body may and will die, we can live forever because of Jesus. Martha was asked that question, do you believe? The question is here for us. Do you believe? Is he just an interesting man? Or is he your savior? Are you trusting him with your life? Are you following him as your Lord? Do you believe? If you would, let's just close in a word of prayer together. We're going to have one last song as our band gets in place. Just actually close your eyes just so there's less distraction. I just want you to consider for a few moments. Do you believe? Some of you here today, the answer is, without a doubt, yes. You've been a believer for many years. And you're encouraged on Easter. We celebrate Easter because this changes everything. The fact that the grave that held Jesus is empty, is alive. We don't worship a memory. We worship a living Savior. And he's able to be at work and do a work in our life. That is good news. And so if you're a follower of Christ, be reminded of that. Be encouraged of that. And remember that you are trusting in him for your life today tomorrow, forever. The issues, the problems that you walked with and, uh, today, you don't bear those alone. I would encourage you even right now, give those to Christ. Find life in those situations. Find hope in those situations. Find mercy 
in those situations. And maybe you walked in here today and unlike Martha, you would say, you know what, I don't know if I believe or no. That might be your answer. No, I don't believe. Oh, well, you see, because we have a God who's alive and a, a God who loves, I believe that God brought you here so that that answer might change. So that you might put your trust in Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior. That you would believe in Him. And even though one day your physical body will die, you'll have life forever because of Jesus. You see, how we believe is simply, uh, it's a mind change. It's a, it's a heart change. It's a life direction change. It's believing that Jesus is who He says He is. To believe that Easter actually happened, that Jesus went to the cross on Good Friday, that He died for the sin of the world, that He died for your sin and my sin, that He was innocent, we were guilty, and He gave His life for us. To believe again that Jesus died, was buried, and that He rose again, that He offers you life today in 2019. I would encourage you and just simply ask this question, do you believe? And the answer was no. Maybe right now you're saying, you know what, I need to change that. I need to change my no to a yes. I need to, to say yes to Jesus and trust Him as my Lord and Savior. If that's your heart, that's where you feel God is leading you, then even right now you simply say, Jesus, today I admit that I'm a sinner. I admit that you died for me. When it comes to sin, that's me. You died for me. Jesus, today I believe that you not only died for my sin, but you were buried and you rose again. I believe you're alive. So Jesus, I call upon you. Come into my life. Be my Lord. Be my Savior. From this day forward, I belong to you. If that's your prayer, if that's your, your heart uh, direction that you're changing to go toward Jesus, then I would encourage you today to believe. Today, receive the gift of life and follow Jesus as your Lord. He is alive and He offers you life today. Receive that even now. Father God, as we just close this time, we're going to have this song that talks about resurrecting. And Lord, I pray that even right now you're bringing dead people to life as we are finding salvation. People are finding salvation in you even now. God, encourage us, remind us the fact that you are the resurrection and that you are our life. God, may we live for you, may we trust in you even today. In your name we pray. Amen.